This is my first year, and, and somehow, I got to put this so it doesn't fall. Somehow, I didn't get a first time badge, so uh, I'm walking around like one of the novices, but uh, it is my first year, so uh, isn't this a beautiful facility? I just, I really like this room, it's really nice. But you know what, there's one thing I can't figure out. I cannot figure out who the lady is on the elevator that keeps telling me if I'm going up or down. And I also can't, I went to breakfast this morning and I, I crossed this four lanes of traffic out here to go to Denny's and I heard this voice saying to wait and then the voice said to go and I thought, well, is that, is that guide related to the lady at the hotel? Is that like a family business or what's going on? And I'm really glad that uh, he didn't say something like pick up the pace because, you know, you get about halfway across and that red light comes on and says you have 20 seconds. It's like, it's like beat the clock. I mean, and I'm, bad, I'm glad he wasn't behind me going, you know, come on, pick up the pace a little bit, sprint, because I, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Well, before I dive into my uh, subject this morning, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. I was diagnosed in 2003 at the age of 38, and I'm currently 52 right now. But I think I have a pretty similar story to a lot of you. It may not be everybody, but in the people I've talked with, it seems to be a common theme. And that is, um, I was diagnosed at 38, but that does not mean that the taxi has always not been a part of my life. Because I was labeled as somewhat clumsy, uh, klutzy kid, didn't have the best balance in the world. But at the, age of, at the age of 30, it then became significant enough that I, went, that I went to the doctor. Now, let me ask you a question. Think back when you were first diagnosed. Do you remember thinking to yourself when the problems first started showing up in your life, do you remember thinking to yourself, oh man, I must have some kind of neurological disease that's going to lead to a condition of a permanent handicap. Because I sure didn't. I, I, I thought there was, honestly, I thought there was something wrong with the hairs in my ear, you know, that the doctor would give me some kind of uh, antibiotics and two weeks later I'd be skipping down the driveway. I mean, you know, but that was not the case. Uh, he put me through a couple balance exercises uh, and after, and my wife and I thought it was kind of a big joke. Uh, and after about 10 minutes, he referred me to a neurologist. Hey, I still didn't, I still didn't connect the dots, the neurologist. I thought, well, he's like a no, ear, nose, throat specialist or something, you know. So I went to the neurologist. He put me through a couple of tests, like an MRI. And he saw some stuff that uh, concerned him. But instead of giving me the diagnosis, he sent me to another neurologist just to confirm, to get a second opinion before he broke the news to me, right? So the, the second neurologist was not a real touchy-feely kind of guy. He watched, me, he watched me walk from about here to the, about halfway down that ramp, and he took me in his office, and in about a minute of very deep compassion, he told me, you have got a permanent disability. There is no cure. Have my secretary validate your parking ticket on the way out. <laughs> and seriously, that's all he told me. So they sent me back to the other neurologist who did a little more, a little more work with me. And, and uh, so there you go. So they did not find any, any reason for it. Uh, so, as today, I stand before you, I have an unknown SCA, but you know, I was thinking about that the other a couple of weeks ago, and I was thinking, everybody else has got a number that I know. And, and I want one too. I felt a little bit jealous about that. So, I came up with a memory system that I feel really represents the taxi that I have that is with me all the time. So, I tell people I have. SCA 
but I, I continued to work. One of the things the neurologist told me up in the second neurologist told me was that in five to ten years I, I was lucky at being in a wheelchair. Well, it's been 14 years. He was wrong about that. And one of the things I learned is that we all, everybody's body, we all have some of the same symptoms, but everybody's body reacts differently. Um, so I was able to continue working up until 2012, which it, at that point then it caught up with me and I, and I lost my lost my job. But at that point, at that point I hadn't been involved in any kind of support group. So at that point, through the NAF's website, I discovered a support group in my area, and I joined that group. And then about 14 months later, I became the leader of that group. Then not long after that, I discovered the need for another support group in Portland, Oregon, which is not far on the other side of where I live. So I started that group. And um, I'm just going to shout out that we have two members from that group that are here with us this weekend. One is Steve, and he's sitting right by my wife. Raise your hand, Steve. And the other is Michael. Last time, Michael back there. Raise your hand, Michael. Okay. And I also, I also, about that time, maybe a little after, uh, through the encouragement of my wife, I started writing my thoughts down. And, uh, and it wasn't meant to be any kind of organized blog or anything, but um, I went ahead and put it on Facebook, and I received quite a bit of a positive reinforcement. So I just kept going, just kept going, just kept going. And I know some of you, some of you have read that. And through it, I, I discovered that I was able to share my experiences with others, but then they could share with me as well. So I've also had the privilege of doing several internet radio interviews. In fact, I just did one about a week and a half before I came out here. And I also had the honor of speaking with a group of students, psychology students at the uh, Oregon State University. Well, make sure this works here. I'm doing the work. There's four reasons why I wanted to come and speak with you today. The first reason is because I just really wanted the chance and I was very excited to meet all those people that I've been making contact with on Facebook over the last few years. We've messaged back and forth and they've spoken my life and I kind of speak it to there, so I was excited. But the second reason, which is closely related to that, is because I was just really excited to meet all of you that are not on Facebook, that I've never talked to before. And as Joel pointed out, this is going to be a very quick weekend, and it's going to be over quickly. And so I, I would like the opportunity to meet just as many as people as I possibly can. So... Uh, if you see me, please say hi. If if I'm not, uh, oh, excuse me. If I'm not uh, paying attention or whatever, just uh, grab me because I'd love to meet new people. The third reason I wanted to come this weekend is because I want to talk about uh, the stages that I believe that we go through from diagnosis on, and these are not hard and fast rules. But from what I, from some of the people that I've talked with, the support groups and online, and in my own life certainly, I've seen certain patterns. I, I like to talk about that. And then fourthly, I came because I want to be an encouragement. I want to encourage you all to see your incredible value. And just let you know that uh, we all have something we, we can contribute. So I would like to begin then by suggesting to you a quote that became part of my life a few years ago that I heard, and I think it totally sums up my dealing with ataxia, and it certainly defines my time with you here today. And that quote is, the hammer that shatters the glass is the same hammer 
that shapes the metal. And why do I say that? Because, again, through my own life, through talking with other people, I have come to understand ataxia to be that hammer that shatters our lives. But, but the encouragement is that we don't have to stay there. And so, starting from the very beginning, there are four stages that I would like to talk about. And again, these are not hard and fast rules, but I'm basing them on some of what I went through and what I've seen in other people. The first one is denial. The second one is isolation. The third one is acceptance. And the fourth one is support. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the first two. And I'm hoping to spend all my time on the last two. So let's begin with the first one, which is denial. You know, I really have come to refer to this stage as left field diagnosis. And the reason I say that is because it is what it is exactly. It hit me out of left field. And unless you know someone in your family, an acquaintance, a friend, that has ataxia, I didn't. I certainly did not know what it was. And so when the doctor gave me that diagnosis, I was like, huh? What? So it can hit us out of nowhere. And when it does, it can bring a very wide range of emotions with it. Everything from fear. Fear that it's a rare and unknown disease and fear that I'm now going to be all alone. It can bring about a real deep sense of sadness. Sadness that your life is now going to change and it's not going to look anything like what you thought it was going to look like. It can bring about a real deep sense of confusion because, let's face it, there's not a lot of information out there. It's like that neurologist that gave me the news. This is what you got. There is no cure. Pay the secretary on your way out the door. That's the way it was. It can also bring out a real deep sense of anger. I know it did in my life, and I still deal with that sometimes. Because it feels like we are now being penalized for something we didn't ask for. Right? People, people treat you differently. My, my money was cut to a certain level. Sure, I collect Social Security, but at, at two-thirds of the wage I was making, in some ways that feels like I'm being penalized. And so I was angry about that. And so the temptation when we have all the feelings bombarding us at, for, at the beginning is just to deny all those things and act like everything is normal for a small way. But I believe that at least for me, what I found that that's what I was doing, that I was entering a second stage. And that was isolation, because it doesn't take very long, depending on how fast you, you degenerate and how fast this, the things come into your life. But it doesn't take very long for people to begin to notice, and you start to notice people beginning to notice you. And it's not very... Uh, it's not always very po positive, excuse me. They accuse us of intoxication, and that's not, that's not a very good thing. And we begin to focus on those things that are, become difficult for us, that used to be so easy, instead of focusing on those things that are still possible for us to do. And we become miserable in the process. Then we begin to develop the attitude or the outlook in our lives that it would now be simpler just to surround myself with a few friends or family that know what I'm going through and stay out of the public. Just stay at home. It'd be easier. No more crowded restaurants. No more movie theaters. It'd be easier just to isolate myself. But when I did that, I began to feel myself becoming bitter. And you know what, that's the time that I really believe that we need to reach out. We need to give ourselves per permission to be who we are as we embrace the next stage of our lives. Let's go on to the next one. Oh, I'm one behind. Which is acceptance. 
You know, everybody has a little different timeline for this. I know people that can be diagnosed and a year later they're going gung-ho and in support and all that. And I know for myself, it took between nine and ten years. Right about the time that I lost my job did I, did I uh, realize what this meant. And at the time it happened, I felt like the, uh, the loss was a little bit premature. I felt like I still had things to offer. I could still do things. So I have started volunteering at, the local, at a local hospice. But that, that resolved itself after about a year and a half because then I gave up my driver's license so I don't do that anymore either. But that's, that's about the time when I began writing the blog I can mention. I realized I could have a, a positive voice. But you know what happened? At the same time, I received encouragement and support. And I quickly learned through that, that in order for me to be a happy person, in order for me to be a productive person, I was going to have to accept the changes that were brought on by an neurological disease. I didn't have to like it. Excuse me, I keep hitting that. I didn't have to like it. But I did have to reconcile myself to the fact that my life had been invaded by a very stubborn guy that wasn't going away anytime soon. But you know, that's the point in which my world got a lot bigger. And I discovered support. And support completely debunked the notion in my life that I was all alone. Because isn't that what a rare disease a diagnosis seems to indicate to you. I don't know if you're like I was, but when he gave me the diagnosis, I thought, oh, for crying out loud, now I'm all, by, now I'm all alone. There's no one else like me. Well, support groups showed me that is not the truth. And so I guess the bottom line here is that we, we will never be a positive force until we reconcile ourselves and accept the fact that, that this is what we have, and then we just move on. And hopefully that will move us into the last stage, which is support. So why do I say support? Well, you all are here this week, and because you know full well why support. Because there is strength in sharing experiences and victories. And strength, is, strength and victories are what's going to move us from the hammer that shatters to the hammer that strengthens. You know, the bonding of a strong metal, let's see if I can do this without hanging on here. The bonding of a strong metal is brought about by, be patient with me, I have a taxi. <laughs> brought about by, by a whole bunch of different metals. And each one is pretty strong on its own. But when you put them together, you've got something that just is on near unbreakable. So each oh okay. So being or not knowing that I wasn't alone brought a deep sense of encouragement to me. So I would challenge you if you are here and you're not in a support group to join a support group. But if that is not even possible, and I know it's not, I've had some people write to me and, and ask about groups in their area, and there is the one, so they can't get to a group. Well, to them, I say, find out if there's a need, and if you can, start a group. Be a support, person, a support group leader. It's really not that hard, not that challenging. I almost feel like I lead too, and I almost feel like I'm a facilitator. I, I make sure we have a place to meet. I line up the speakers. I communicate with everybody. I kind of keep the discussion going, but... They're not, it's their group. All you're doing is helping it come together. So it doesn't have to be a big scary thing. But as we are all faced with a neurological disease that brings about the progressive condition of ataxia, we're all facing multiple stages of advancement. And at that point, we have to ask ourselves, are we going to let it shatter us? Are we going to let it strengthen our resolve. 
So from shatter to strength. We all need to understand our value to the whole group. Because each one of us comes from a very unique place with differing and positive ways of dealing with things. That's one of the things I belong to. I don't know how many groups on Facebook, maybe 28, 29, I've lost count. But one of the benefits of that was there are so many different ways of dealing with stuff. Somebody will write in and ask the group, hey, I've got this going on, what do you suggest? And there will be sometimes 25, 30 responses, and each one of them is different. And each one of them is going to work. I'm not saying that they all, everything works for everybody, because everybody's different. But there may very well be something in there that works for you. And I just want to let you know that Everybody can be an encouragement to somebody else. We all have something to contribute. Do you realize that the first part of that word encouragement is in? And what that simply means is to insert or put something into something else. So I challenge you all to endeavor to become that person that inserts courage into someone else's life. So in closing, I would just like to reemphasize a few things here. Accept yourself. You don't know how many people, and maybe you are in this room and you're struggling with this, but there's a couple of people from my Portland support group that are, they just cannot accept. And it's hard. I know it's hard. I'm not saying I've got all the answers. But we need that we need to accept. We need to, to accept and move on. You need to give yourself permission to be who you are and to be able to see your great worth and your great value. And I just want to challenge you again to be a person that inserts courage in someone else's life. Be willing to share your story with someone else. And get involved on any level that you can. Again, I suggest support group. If not that, then become a leader. If not that, then at least join the support groups online. And I know a great place to start is the NAF page. That's where I started. And from there, you can just branch out. So be the strength and encouragement for someone else so that they will be there for you. Because as we progress we will easily find ourselves going through any one of these stages all over again, feeling these emotions. And it's just great to have other people alongside of you that that say either, I've been there, or what can we do to help you out? So I thank you for your time this morning and your attention. Thank you.